a legal and crypto reporter from Fortune. He's also the editor of Ledger and currently writing a book on Coinbase. Sit back, relax, and let's hear what these great minds have to say. Thanks, Kevin, for joining us. Uh, welcome, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Charlie, you know, you're best known, of course, for starting Litecoin and a uh, key early engineer at Coinbase. Then 20, 2017, you sold your Litecoin, left Coinbase. Uh, so what's retirement like? <laughs> I'm joking. What have you been doing since then? Um, I'm focused on Litecoin. Uh -huh. So um, in, I think, mid-2016, uh, I delivered Coinbase to Coinbase and then I started working on Litecoin and focused more on Litecoin. And then um, was working part time at Coinbase, and uh, 2017 I left Coinbase and basically full time on Litecoin. Well, what's the nature of your work on Litecoin right now? Um, pretty much everything from development to um, just working with partners and then uh, trying to get more adoption. Uh -huh. um, Litecoin was in the news recently. Mike Novogratz took a bit of a shot of it, saying, you know, hey everyone, don't sell Litecoin, buy Bitcoin. This Litecoin's just a test net for Bitcoin, which I think most people disagreed with, but I figured I'd put it back to you to see what you thought of that. Um, just, it was pretty surprising to see that tweet. I didn't realize he was a Litecoin hater. <laughs> um, uh, maybe he missed out on the, the gains this year and was upset. It's up 40%, right? So. Um, this year it's like up 200% or something like that. Um, it's, it's doing well. I think, yeah, I mean, we get that every now and then. Um, people are shorting Litecoin and getting on it. Um, yeah, but it's, I mean, Litecoin's been around for uh, eight years. Yeah, almost eight years now, so it's, it's, it's doing well. Yeah, that's one of the OG coins, yeah. Um, we had an interesting talk before this uh, over lunch about scaling, which is, of course, a big topic. But since the title of the panel is the past, the present, the future, I'd like to go back to the past a bit in the debate over Bitcoin Classic. There was this enormous fight in 2016 over, you know, the, the, the blocks are too small, we have to increase them to at least two megabytes and stuff. And you opposed that. You preferred smaller blocks. Can you perhaps just sort of maybe repeat or share, you know, why you held that view? Um, it's been a while since it's been Bitcoin Classic. <laughs> Um, I, I actually am, was fine with the 2 megabyte box has increased. What I opposed was um, trying to, like, exchanges or companies trying to make that happen just to say, like, we should do it and let's do it. And then without caring about what the developers thought, what the users thought, I thought that we were going to reach, like, more, more of a consensus before we can actually move them to force it to happen. Um, so that's what I was against. Not necessarily the 2 megabyte box has increased. I think um, if you increase the block size by too much, um, it hurts decentralization, which in the end will hurt censorship resistance, which is what actually gives um, Bitcoin or Litecoin value in the first place. So I'm pretty against um, hurting decentralization. But it's, it's arguable what's the optimal block size. Like Bitcoin is one megabyte, Litecoin is effectively four megabytes. So it's, it's hard to say what's optimal, but right now I think we're good where we are. Right, and the, the fear at the time was if you, uh, if you allowed bigger blocks, then that would consolidation of nodes, and then that would expose them to government interference. Yeah, the, the idea is that, um, for example, like even with, with Ethereum, it's really hard to run a full node for Ethereum today. Um, so not many people do, and again, right now, most of the nodes are running in one um, data center uh, by a few companies, few major companies. If someone really, if the government really wants to like censor the transaction, um, it's so hard today. But if it gets worse, then they can just approach like a few companies and say, censor these transactions, or we're going to put you in jail, or right. something to that effect. So it becomes um, more centralized, and this is this will like kill the value of Bitcoin, right? It may not kill the value of Ethereum because Ethereum has is not like focused on money, but being money, you really want it to be um, censorship resistant. That makes sense. And turning to the current scalability um, attempts, we heard some discussion of lightning and stuff. Do you think the problem is being solved on, um, well, I guess, the state of Bitcoin and Ethereum? Oh, which problem? The scaling problem. I mean, if we had another giant bull run like we had in 2017, would we see the same, you know, problems and choke points play out? It's, and... it's not solved yet. Right? Lightning Network is still beta. Um, there's still there's growing pains. Right? We are working on um, 
solving scaling over there to potentially like layer three solutions. But um, if we go into another bull run like this year, we'll see like we're already seeing like higher fees on Bitcoin already, right? So we'll see high fees again because um, I mean the reason why fees are high on Bitcoin is because uh, there is demand for it, right? People are willing to pay the fees because when you compare Bitcoin with the traditional um, system where a wire takes like $30 or 50 depending on where you're sending it, where you're, who's receiving it, um, sending like hundreds of million dollars for like $10 is cheap. So your Bitcoin, um, at least the, the base layer, cannot service both people wanting to send million dollars compared with people wanting to buy coffee on it. So that's why like, a secondary solution is needed where it's cheap and fast, um, and it's backed by the base layer. Um, and that's, that's, that's going to take a few more years to actually make it so simple that you're using it without realizing it. Well, for right now, would any of the pressure be taken off? I mean, if we did suddenly you know, go to Bitcoin prices of 2017, would it be as bad? Would the fees be as high? And would the transaction time be as long? Um, it's hard to say. I think it's better. Like, I think people, I think Lightning Network is definitely taking some pressure off of the base chain right now. Um, and people are working hard to make that better. Um, I don't expect us to see a crazy bull run like 2017 this year. Um, but we might be ready when it comes. Yeah. Um, that's a, a good segue. A few people asked me on Twitter to ask you, I don't know if you're going to answer it, but um, about your trading instincts because you, um, they say you both predicted the bottom of the market and sold at the top. Was that, um, you know, based on any mathematical insight or like that feeling or any shame on that? Blind luck. I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, being honest with this, right? So when I, when I sold, I wasn't trying to time the top. I thought like one would actually go to $1,000. Um, and I actually didn't want to sell at the top because I don't want to be hated for by everyone, which is what's happening right now. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I didn't sell because I was trying to cash out the top. I sold because I felt like there was a conflict between me being very active in the community, talking about stuff, and also holding the coins. And I also wanted to focus on adoption versus price. And it's not that correlated. So a lot of times I have a conflict wondering if I'm posting some tweet because I want the price to go up, or if it's actually best for Litecoin. And I just didn't want to think about that or be in question about it. Um, yeah, so I think that timing was just blind luck. And then also calling the bottom, I just took 90% off of the top. And said, <laughs> uh, basically, my tweet was that if you can't handle the price dropping 90%, um, don't hold on to this super volatile currency. Because I've seen that happen like twice already. Right? I've seen Bitcoin drop from $30 to $2. Right? I've seen Litecoin drop from $50 to like $1. So if you can't handle that kind of volatility, you might want to rethink your investment strategy. You don't want to put in more money than you can afford to lose. Of course, nobody listened to me. And people, the people who are hurting are the ones that actually can't, um, can't withstand that kind of drop in price. But you actually walked the walk, and Bitcoin went from 30 to $2. You, you held $30 Bitcoin, right? Yeah, I bought more. It's like, the reason why is because the, um, the fundamentals didn't change. Right, so the price was at 30 because of a pump, um, but when it dropped, I looked at it, I'm like, Bitcoin is as good as it was before. Did nothing change, so why should I sell? The same thing for um, last year's drop. Right, last year, um, Bitcoin and Litecoin were doing well. Like, nothing has really changed fundamentally. Um, we're getting more institutional investment into Bitcoin into the space. Um, like back is launching, potentially Starbucks may even accept Bitcoin. There's all this, all this good news coming out. The prices drop, but fundamentally it's as strong as ever. Um, you carry away in on the current rally, which you know, people are just kind of months in. Some say it's like you know, the April Fool's Day stories in China. There are other people that are say it's short sellers. What's, do you have any insight? First of all, I'm going to take full credit for <laughs> like, my price coming back up. Since I get the living from every drop, I'm going to take all the credit. all because of me. Um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of weird because what happened a few days ago when with that rally, I saw the April Fool's joke, right? The finance magnet saying that um, Bitcoin ETF is being approved by a last-minute uh, SEC SEC meeting, 
And then I also saw like a tweet or a message from Chinese Twitter, someone saying, someone saying that this is true because maybe it was lost in translation. Um, so maybe potentially that sparked off the rally, um, or at least the beginning of it. But then when price goes up, anything can happen, right? Those, the stop orders can trigger, and people would get excited. So maybe that was the trigger. Maybe it was something else. But it definitely started something. And then like now we're, we had a nice little rally. Okay. Um, not to push you further, but do you think this rally is going to go on for a while, or is it just kind of a mini bubble? Why do you think I know all the answers? <laughs> Everyone keeps asking, yeah. asking me like, what I, like, as if I know what the future will be. But like, I think if people tell you what like they know what the price will be, they're just pulling stuff out of you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, no one really knows, right? Yeah. yeah. Fair point. Let's let's move on to other stuff in terms of the larger kind of technological landscape. Um, I think Ari Paul's talk was interesting to me, just on that sense of what's being built right now, how a lot of it really isn't kind of uh, ready for mainstream consumers. And as a journalist, I'm almost surprised, because during the crypto winter, I'm seeing a lot of neat companies building neat stuff. But if anything, the technology is getting more esoteric and further away from people. And I think the average person, my friends, my parents, are less interested in crypto than they were two years ago. You know, of course, two years ago, the speculative thing made it on the news every day. But one would think that we start seeing kind of like companies building user interfaces that would make the average person care about crypto. And as far as I can tell, that's not happening. Is that a problem or is that, is that surprising? I think it's a slow process. Um, cryptocurrency is still hard to use. Um, and one of the, the main reason, reason why I joined Coinbase uh, back in 2013 is wanting to make Bitcoin easy to use. At least Coinbase made buying and selling um, very easy. Right? But in terms of like using it, it's still pretty hard. Um, especially when compared to like um, like in the US where people are using credit cards. Right? It's so easy to just strike a credit card. Um, although they made that a bit harder now where you have to plug it, put in a chip. Um, but it's, it's easy, right? Compared to Bitcoin, it's just, in order for Bitcoin to actually become more popular than it is today, we have to make it easy, as easy as Visa, credit cards, or even easier. And a little bit larger landscape of, you know, smart contracts and stuff, because I'm, you know, watch people build dApps and user numbers, and man, they're like, you know, double digits, you know, as in like 12 people. Um, you know, for some of these widely touted projects like, you know, Augur and Bancor and stuff like that. Um, so the DAP landscape seems to have kind of been a bit of a bust. And now there's a buzz about decentralized exchanges. But, you know, again, the user base is, is, is tiny. So it's just, just a necessary step. I never really believed too much into the story of DAP, right? So decentralized applications, there's a decentralization is a means to an end. And the end is censorship resistance or immutability. And not many apps really need that, right? So uh, one perfect example is, is CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties like, brought the Ethereum network down because it's super inefficient. Um, if CryptoKitties was running on Google or Amazon data centers, uh, it would be perfectly fine. A centralized data center running it, um, no one would really be worried that Google or Amazon will steal your CryptoKitties. Um, so you don't really need decentralization, but you're paying for it. So all these dApps, the reason why um, there aren't too many users is because the experience is, is not as good when it's uh, inefficient. All right, so I think the really successful dApps are like the, the gambling websites, right? the ones where actually they do need censorship resistance because you can't do that anywhere else. So that's why like the Silk Rose or the, the gambling websites are popular using cryptocurrency. Um, yeah, so the other dApps that are trying to like having games or anything like that, they're, they're inefficient and it's hard to make the UI like when, it, when that's happening. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't really need decentralized digital cats, but for borderline illegal transactions, like some gambling things, you want to That makes sense. Um, um, you mentioned um, uh, some of the big corporates. I'm jumping around a bit here, but um, in terms of what's going to spark the next kind of crypto spring, um, what do you make about what Facebook's doing? The blockchain team is now up to you know, dozens and dozens of people, and we're hearing noises about Facebook coin and stuff like that. What do you think's going on there? Um, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but I mean, Facebook coin doesn't really excite me. The reason why I'm focused on like Bitcoin and Litecoin is I'm kind of working on sound money, right? So Facebook coin obviously would be a centralized 
digital currency, so it's not nothing compared to Bitcoin or Litecoin. So, yeah, I mean, it's not like companies haven't done that before coming out with a coin. Um, so unless they're doing something interesting, which I don't see the case right now, it's, yeah, it's not that interesting. Right. So, so that's just sort of like corporate blockchain or, or fake blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. Sense. Um, uh, what about other technologies out there? A couple of people on Twitter raised with me atomic swaps. Is that a big deal to you? Or? For sure, yeah. So with um, with Lightning Network running on both Bitcoin and Litecoin, you can do um, cross-chain atomic swaps. So in a decentralized, non-custodial manner, I can um, send you Litecoin and you can receive Bitcoin on the other end. And it just works. It's kind of like magic where it's on both chains at the same time. and converts. Um, I think that's pretty cool. I think it's a cool technology that, it's, that people are working on. It's not really fleshed out yet. But there are a lot of cool things that can be built on top of um, Bitcoin, on top of Litecoin, on top of the Lightning Network. Um, yeah, we, we just started scratching the surface. We're still very early. What other kind of emerging technologies in crypto are really exciting to you? Um, one thing I'm kind of looking into right now is to make uh, Litecoin more fungible. So the technology I'm looking into is uh, Memo Memo. It's a way that makes uh, Litecoin transactions or transactions private without sacrificing scalability. So um, previously, all these uh, privacy um, technologies all require um, kind of larger transactions, which hurts hurts scalability. So for example, like. Um, Confidential transactions used to be like 20 times the size of a regular transaction. Now with bulletproofs, it's only three times the size, so it has improved. But still, for scalability, it's always a compromise between um, privacy and scalability. Um, but with Mimbo Wimbo, um, they're able to do it where it's both private and scalable. It actually helps um, each other, and I think that's very cool. So that's something I'm looking into. And privacy is needed for fungibility. Um, by that, I mean, you, if I'm sending uh, Litecoins to you, and currently, you can see like the whole history of the coin I sent you, which shows you, eventually you can look into it and see like which, um, if I actually used Silk Road, or if I did something, if I gambled with it, and that's not, that's not good for, for good sound money. Right? When, you're, when you're spending money, you have to like pick and choose which $20 bill you want to pick out of your wallet to send, because one of them is tainted. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I'm really um, looking forward to, which is making Litecoin more fungible. So almost retroactively turning Litecoin into a privacy coin. Yeah, um, it's, it'll, it'll be tricky. Um, and for me, some of the technology goes over my head, but Wimbo Wimbo, the, to the degree I understand this stuff, which isn't much. Um, I know um, uh, the thing that Zuko is building relies on like zero knowledge proofs and snarks. Is that the same technology? Or? Uh, no, it's a bit different. Uh, the basic idea of Nimble Wimble is that um, for each block, it takes all the transactions, inputs and outputs, combines it together, throws away all the unnecessary stuff, and then also throws away any intermediate uh, inputs and outputs. So for example, if I sent you one Litecoin, assuming it's on Nimble Wimble, and you sent uh, someone else one Litecoin, those two transactions can combine into just me sending that other, or, or like someone sending so it's like a Tumblr. Litecoin. It doesn't have like your go through you, that transaction can just be dropped and forgotten. Right. So by like removing that kind of information, it makes it more private. But if you upgraded the, 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 the protocol to be able to do that, wouldn't that immediately result in Litecoin being kicked off Coinbase in every major exchange? Um, it's definitely a risk, but it won't be like it won't be a hard fork where everything gets converted. So the idea right now is to make it an extension block where you can move your Litecoins into the extension blocks or into a space where everything is memo window, and then you can also move it out. Um, so being, it will be a soft fork, so exchanges may not even support the memo window side of things. Okay. Um, and if they do, it will be similar to how they support um, Zcash, right? where you can still ask the, the recipient to show you where the money came from. Um, but yeah, it's, so it's more private, but you can, you can opt into you uh, show. Interesting. And could you see that this this happening to Bitcoin as well? A uh, protocol created to about this? Um, well, Litecoin being a glorified test of Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but I, I think it's it's a good test to see how um, to see if this works and also to see how potentially how the the regulatory environment um, treats something like like when being right now every pretty much every single exchange like what would happen. Um, I don't think it's I think it's good for Litecoin. Um, I think Bitcoin eventually will get fungibility because I think fungibility is really uh, a feature of a property of sound money that's missing. Um, eventually we'll, we'll get it on Bitcoin also. Before we spoke, I asked you about other coins. You said you're primarily um, just focused on Bitcoin and Litecoin, but um, I'm going to put in the spot and ask you again. And say, if you had to just list one other coin, what, do you th what is the most interesting coin to you beyond Bitcoin and Litecoin? Um, Monero. So I've always um, thought that Monero's approach of 100% um, like full privacy, like it's not opt-in at least in the transactions private, is is really cool. Um, there's no when when you're sending Monero, there's just absolutely no trace of it. No one can tell anything that you're doing. Um, yeah, I think Monero is pretty good, and that's also why I'm working on making that like one more perfect. Interesting. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm sure there's got to be some questions over for Charlie. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, with the issue of privacy, how would you address like double spending issues with Litecoin? Um, you're not doing it like Monero. Um, what's, what's the concern? Oh, with, like the double spending issue where you can't see the entire ledger. How are you going to address like making sure there's no one like is double spending on the uh, blockchain? So you can still see the ledger, right? Um, it's just more private where you, it's harder to to see who's like what you're doing versus what someone else is doing. Um, with confidential transaction, uh, uses cryptography to hide the amount, to blind the amount, so you don't know how much is being transacted. So there is a risk of it's not double spending; it's um, risk of hidden inflation, okay. right? Where if someone breaks that crypto um, using um, quantum computers, for example. If that comes out and breaks the cryptography, you could potentially print more money and no one would actually notice. And that's something that um, we're, we have different ways of, of solving this. It's very technical. If you're interested, um, look into um, switch commitments, um, algorithm uh, proofs. Yeah. Google, Google those things and you'll, you'll find out more about how, how combination transactions can handle um, computing. Uh, please go ahead, and then in the back after. Charlie, thank you for your time. Uh, it is IAB right now. My question is about uh, privacy uh, from another angle. Yeah. Uh, at DEF CON, uh, Vlad spoke about putting ZK snarks on, uh, on, on Ethereum. I know you're a Bitcoin like Wayne guy. Can you share a little bit of light on your thoughts about that? About ZK snarks? On, on Ethereum. Um, and I don't know too much about what they're specifically they're doing. Um, so, ZK Snarks and like, the different privacy uh, solutions have different trade-offs, right? Some of them are, have really large um, size and only takes a long time to calculate, right? For example, I think ZK Snarks doesn't have um, like a trusted setup, is that right? Whereas ZK Snarks has trusted setup, so trusted setup and you have to trust someone that they didn't um, keep the, the keys and they can just create more money. So there's definitely different trade-offs. Um, I think ZK Stars doesn't scale as well as as um, Mimble Wimble. Um, but I do I do like what they're doing. That just trying different privacies and adding more privacy solutions. And I think we had a question way in the back there. So, oh, okay, that was louder than I thought it would be. Um, uh, so Charlie, uh, you reference a few minutes ago, uh, quote, Litecoin, a glorified testnet of Bitcoin. I'm guessing you're referring to the conversation that's going on on Twitter between you and Mike Novogratz. So uh, naturally in blockchain, there is a lot of uh, absolutism about people getting behind a given blockchain or cryptocurrency. So I was hoping maybe you could speak a little bit about uh, uh, blockchain culture and perhaps uh, maybe a better way to go about how all of these larger than life figures in our industry are maybe going back and forth about the different technologies and uh, you know perhaps uh, more ways to collaborate or something. So how do we make crypto people behave better? Um, yeah, so I guess just commenting on the fact that crypto Twitter is very toxic. 
um, just a lot of people fighting. Um, I think the reason why that happens with crypto is because it's money, right? People are invested in their specific projects and they feel like it's a, um, close to like a winner take all. So it's like zero sum game, right? So if, if for example, I thought like Litecoin is doing well, then it hurts Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, and that's why the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin uh, maximalists will come out attacking Litecoin, and and vice versa. Um, I'm not. I don't have a solution for that. Um, what I've done personally is I've been trying to be less toxic. So um, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm not out there attacking Bitcoin Cash, even though it sucks. <laughs> You're only attacking the person from now on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't have a solution for you. Please go ahead. Uh, there's, a, there's been some talk about um, what Bitcoin is, uh, store value will be used um, to spend. What do you see um, in the future for Litecoin and Bitcoin? Um, I mean, since the beginning when I first launched Litecoin, I always saw it as a complement to Bitcoin. Right. Um, I saw it and that was what Noble Grass was hiding. I saw it as silver to Bitcoin's gold, where in, in our past history, we've seen like silver and gold both act as, as money, right? And I see that happen in the future where Bitcoin and Litecoin could be used hand in hand. And to a certain degree where you may actually not realize that you're using one or both, right? With like atomic swaps, I can send you Litecoin and you can receive Bitcoin because you know on Litecoin or, or vice versa. Um, I definitely see them working together. Um, and the black one being like a little brother to Bitcoin. Um, did you ever work with Satoshi Nakamoto? Uh, <laughs> not that I know of. Um, yeah, I, he, he disappeared from the scene a few months before I, I found out about Bitcoin. Okay, when I'm back here. Uh, in, way back in the news or after. I think, I don't think it's, it's very good, right? It's, 
I think the problem is they're causing confusion, um, trying to claim that they're a the real Bitcoin and a Bitcoin. They're, they're calling it Bitcoin Core for some reason, saying that that's like that's a separate coin and it's a it's a fork of Bitcoin and they're a the real Bitcoin. I think it's just causing a lot of confusion, especially when um, Bitcoin.com is pushing for Bitcoin Cash and then the Bitcoin Twitter account is also pushing for Bitcoin Cash. It's just it's just confusing. All right, so if they I think if they if they just um, accept their different identity, whatever they are, right, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV, and push for that, I think that's that's perfectly fine. I'm okay with that because we have a lot of we have a lot of stuff about all coins, right? And we're all fighting for um, trying to figure out which ones are, are valuable. But trying to say that they're the real Bitcoin when obviously they're not because Bitcoin is still here and it's like has like twenty times the value, twenty times the hash rate of these other coins. It doesn't make sense for for them to, to be doing that. So I think that's pretty bad for the community, for the for the industry when that happens. I've got a quick follow-up to that. What do you make of the recent 51% attacks against, I think, Bitcoin Gold a few months ago, then Ethereum Classic more recently? What's Why did that happen? Is there a risk of that happening again with other coins? Um, it just shows that if you're not the dominant coin in your respective like mining algorithm, you're at risk. So one of the things that when I launched Litecoin and made sure I was to not compete uh, against Bitcoin for hash rate. Right, so Litecoin uses script, Bitcoin uses child 36 And these four coins, like Bitcoin Cash, has less than 5% of uh, Bitcoin's hash rate. Right, so they're susceptible to attacks. Um, just surprisingly, it hasn't happened yet because it's relatively easy if you want to kill or hurt Bitcoin Cash, then you, you can do that. Um, yeah, so one thing about uh, kind of the nature of cryptocurrencies is uh, security is very important. Right? So security gives, also gives the coin value. So um, that's, um, that's something that we have to make sure that the coin is secure. And that's something I think about quite a bit too, about like coin security, if there's enough mining hash rate on it, um, whether it's decentralized, no one has control over it. And you think Litecoin is safe? Litecoin is very safe, yeah. Right. We have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Oh, yeah. So you mentioned uh, you think about how much security Litecoin needs, and it seems like it's one of the hard things for proof of work currencies, where you don't know how much you need, and oftentimes you you may end up paying for more as a system. How do you evaluate you know what level um, of security you should have? Um, it's actually quite easy, right? So. Uh, if you look at how much money is protecting the Litecoin network, so you look at um, the hash rate, right? Divide that by um, the like the average or the best Litecoin uh, machine, right? And then you can figure out how much in dollar value of ASICs is protecting the network, right? For Litecoin, I don't remember the last I checked was like hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So if someone wants to attack the Litecoin network they would have to create or buy hundreds of millions of dollars of ASICs to attack the network. And also, you look at the electricity costs, um, the hash rate is the, the network is spending to attack it. So that's like the total cost, right? The, the, the upfront cost and the ongoing cost to attack the network. So then you look at um, how much is the network like, protected, or how much value is moving um, every block or every hour. So you compare those numbers. if. If you're moving like hundreds of millions of dollars and cost like one million to attack the network, then it's not secure, right? If you're only moving one million dollars, but there's a hundred million dollars for taking the network, then it's relatively more secure. Um, that's one way to look at it. Great. Well, I think we're out of time. It's such a good to but thanks for much, Charles. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.